Hi everyone, Stepan here. I'm going to show you the round 4 game from the first creation league. And I, I, I decided to share this with you uh, because I think it's important. Uh, I, I almost cried after this game. I may have cried, but, but I, I cannot really remember if I actually shed a tear. But I felt... I, I don't know how to describe that feeling. Maybe you'll, you'll feel 1% of it after you see the game. <sighs> okay, so I'm playing a very strong international master. Started with the English, transposed into Doretti. I played my usual stuff. I played the London. Uh, he went for b3, which allows bishop f5 easily because there's no queen b3. Bishop b2 e6. Now you have to be careful not to allow knight h4. But as long as there's bishop to g4, that, that should be fine. Bishop e2. Now there's no bishop g4, so h6. Castles, bishop e7. You don't want your bishop on d6 in most of these positions. d3 played. Uh, maybe he wants to play e4 in the future. Maybe not. Maybe he wants to play for a4. Uh, this is a reversed Queen's Indian for white uh, with d6 instead of d5 or for white with d3 instead of d4, which means that the e4 square is not weak. Uh, and this is the position I play with the black when I when I play the queen's Indian. And I, I love the position. My idea is usually to jump into e5 and then play f4. That's how I play it. Uh, and I find the positions very pleasant. Uh, I castled, he played knight c3, knight bd7, queen c1. And here I went for a plan which I learned when I was when I was studying these positions, I found a very nice plan played by, uh, I think it was played in the 70s for the first time by one of the Russian, maybe it was Smyslov, I, I'm not sure. Sorry for not remembering the game. But the idea is you don't play in the center or on the king side. You have two bishops pointing on the queen side, so queen b8. And the idea is rook f to c8 or rook c8, the other rook cannot come to c8. So after rook d1, I go rook c8, and my plan is now to play a5, a4, just blow the position open, and have my two bishops working uh, wonders here. If I ever get to play a4, I may even sack the exchange, because if b takes a4, then d takes c4, and once d takes c4, I get the e5 square for my pieces. That, that's one of the patterns. It, I don't have to sack the exchange, but basically, I, if not a5, maybe I play b5. Okay, so I want to play on the queen side. Queen d2, bishop h7 in anticipation of e4, rook dc1, and he changes his mind. This means that rook d1 was a mistake, or that after he saw what I was doing, he decided to switch. Okay, a5. And now he, he has to do something. If he doesn't do anything, then I'm going to play b5 and a4 and just gain a lot of space. So he took on d5. And here, uh, well, you can basically decide whether you want equality or if you want a complicated position. Taking with the knight I don't think is good uh, because I don't really want to trade my f6 knight for his c3 knight. And I want a pawn on d5 to prevent e4 so I can take e takes or c takes. e takes creates an imbalance in the position, but with what, with what I did... I think it's important to have more play on the queen side. And when we were playing, I couldn't decide which capture gives me more play. Uh, by taking with the e pawn, I le I'm leaving myself an extra pawn on the queen side, which gives me options to play c5, b5, b4, b5, a4, c5, c4. But by taking with the c pawn, which I did in the game, I, I get to open up the c file and. There are very interesting patterns uh, in this position, which I've been learning when I was studying the setup with queen b8, uh, rook c8, which is to move the queen away, get the knight to c6, get the other knight to d7, maybe knight b6 after b5 followed by a4. So you, you're basically pointing all of your stuff on the queen side, and, and that seems easy to understand, and it seems easy to come up with moves. I mean, look at these two bishops, look at the rooks, look, look at the queen, everything is pointing in the same direction, while these two bishops, even though they are perfectly fine, don't really do much on the queen side. Okay, he played a4. He needs to prevent my expansion with b5. I continued knight c5. This is a tempo move, 
But it's not about attacking b3. It's about, since he played a4, using the biggest weakness in his position, and that's knight a6, knight b4. So he has to prevent knight b3, queen d1, knight a6, knight b5. Fine, he gets the, the same thing. I played knight d7. Uh, I don't want to obviously allow bishop here because that would win the game. So knight b5 came with a threat. So after knight b5, I need to prevent bishop e5. So I went knight d7. And now I can continue with my own plans. He exchanged rooks here and played rook c1, which isn't really a big deal. I can always challenge the c-file with rook c8. And here he played d4, which uh, improves both of our positions. Uh, you could say that it improves his more because d3 is no longer a, a weakness, but it makes these two bishops actually good. Okay, rook c8 before knight b4. I want to challenge the, the c-file, knight e1. Very nice move. Uh, controlling the b4 square, so once I play knight b4, if he plays knight d3, I'm going to snap that off in a second. Uh, the whole idea is I need to keep a piece on b4. If I can keep a piece on b4, then I'm controlling the entire queen side. And of course, my follow-up plan is going to be knight b8 with either knight c6 or knight a6 to make sure that once pieces come to d3 I can safely exchange and then plant another knight into b4. So of course he, he doesn't play knight d3 because knight d3 exchanges a piece that's not controlling b4 for a piece that's controlling b4 and for the moment this middle game is really all about the b4 square. So instead he played rook c3. Okay, uh, knight b8, just continuing with my plan. Uh, he cannot play queen c1 uh, to double up the pressure uh, because I can just take on, on c3 and he didn't really achieve much. I cannot play knight a2 because my rook is undefended. So rook c8, queen c8, bishop c3 wants to take my knight. I'm not allowing that, knight to c6. Of course, I always need to keep a piece on d3. Queen d2, b6. Uh, this is... A prophylactic move which gives my queen a couple of more squares and also makes knight a7 worse in the event of my knight moving away because I can play queen b7 instead of queen a8. Uh, g3 was played and this is an excellent idea. Uh, the idea is basically to, to get this knight into play uh, without trading it off uh, on, uh, by my b4 knight. So I have to do something about that. If this knight manages to get back into play, then I could have some issues. Maybe knight f3, knight e5. So I, I played bishop e4, and the idea is, again, this knight can control the b4 square, this bishop cannot. So if the knight goes to g2 or to f3, I just take it off, and I need to keep controlling b4. This is not really an attacking move. I don't really care about a kingside attack. I just want to get rid of this knight. If I can get rid of this knight, that means that I'm going to be controlling b4 for the rest of the game. h4, which is kind of a loose move, and here I had some ideas of attacking uh, with e5. Nah, but it didn't really work, so after takes, maybe bishop h4 takes. I, 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 I don't have anything, so I didn't go for that. Uh, I went for queen d8 instead. Queen d8 improves my queen. Uh, I'm again controlling more of the dark squares. Maybe in the future I could be taking on uh, on h4. So he plays bishop to f3. Uh, of course, wants to trade off a piece that's not controlling d3 so that he can safely put his knight uh, somewhere here. I have to take. And the good thing about taking on f3 is that his knight is now away from b4. Okay, queen c8. I changed my mind. I need to stay close to the c-file, and since the pieces are getting traded off, I need to keep control over the c1 square. Of course, he is threatening to take on b4, and after knight b4 to play queen c1, so I had to play queen c8. Bishop b4, knight b4. You can see that it's useful that he doesn't have queen c1 or queen c3 in this position. Knight e5. Fine, h5 just blocking the position up. I don't want to allow an expansion. Uh, king to g2, g6, safe move, giving my king g7, also giving my king way into the position. Here he played knight d3. 
unfortunately, he got the better of me in the exchanges uh, revolving around around b5. I'm going to be stuck with a bishop b4. I'm going to stuck, be stuck with a bishop on b4. But it's still okay. I mean, this bishop is a good piece. My pawns are on light squares. Uh, f2 is a weakness. And if he gets too excited and moves his king away, then maybe bishop e1 could come in the future. Maybe even some sacrifices with bishop g3. Okay, king g7, improving my king. And here he offered the queen trade, uh, which, I mean, this is just probably equal. Uh, I'm not sure who the queen trade would favor. The position becomes simpler to play. And both kings have a way into the position after that. So I accepted the queen trade. And also, if I don't accept the queen trade, he's controlling the c-file. So I have to accept the queen trade. So takes, takes. King f8. Now, I could have played king f6, but I didn't really, really want to get into his position because he can always just play f3 for the moment and his king can keep defending g3. And my bishop still doesn't have the d6 square. So I decided to go around king f8, king f3. And once he played king f3, which means that he cannot play f3, I need to go back. I need to prevent his king from entering my position. Because if my king is not controlling his king, that means that my bishop is going to have to stay on f6, which is bad, because that gives his knight a ton of freedom. Obviously, with my bishop on f6, these three are defended, so I don't really want to use my bishop just to control his king, so I had to do that with my king. So I changed my mind. Then he saw that I changed my mind, and then he changed his mind. And then I didn't want to change my mind again because he won a tempo. His king is not on g2, but on e2, so I played king f6. Trying to provoke f3. Knight c3, king f5, f3. Okay. Now, uh, I went back with my king. Uh, I, I could get mated. I should mention if I play bishop f6, then e4 and trouble. So I played king back to f6. My king is not coming into the position anymore. There is no way. I just need a bishop on d6. King to d2. Uh, bishop d8 first. Bishop on, the bishop on c7 should be better than on d6 because uh, this way I can move my king into the position first. Knight d3. Finally got the trade in, which is fine. Okay, so knight d3, king d3. And now bishop to c7, attacking the pawn. He only has one move. He has to play f4. And let's talk about this position. Uh, mm -hmm. So, th th there is one fact which I knew. If the minor pieces stay on the board, this is a draw. And it's not, maybe it's a draw. It's not, it's a hard draw for either side. It's a draw. Because there's no way to make progress. Uh, if white plays riskily, then my bishop really could come into the position and start taking pawns. If white is not careful immediately, maybe my king comes into the position and starts taking the pawns. If the minor pieces get traded off the board, whether it's a draw or if either side could win, is going to depend on what happens after e4. That's the second fact. So those two things I had in mind. So if I play king f5, which I didn't play, he cannot play e4. That much is clear, because after e4 I play king g4, and he takes ed, ed, knight d, I just go bishop d8, and there's absolutely no hope for white here, because I'm going to win two pawns, He's never going to win any of my pawns. My bishop is absolutely controlling his knight. And even if he tries to queen the, e, the d pawn, my bishop is blocking the queening square. So after king f5, uh, he plays king e2. And after king g4, he plays king f2. And I would have played bishop d6 here. And after knight b5, bishop back to b8. And I think this is just a draw. I, I don't see a way to make progress. He cannot move his king. He has to sort of repeat moves with his knight, but I, I don't see what I can do either. Uh, so that's why I didn't play king f5. Believe it or not, I was really trying to win this position. I thought I was, I, I, I had more winning chances. Even though I, I realized this was equal, I thought it was easier to play with the bishop. So I play king e7. And 
my calculation here went how many moves deep? Five moves deep. No, seven moves deep. And again, I made the mistake of seeing everything correctly. Mm. I saw everything correctly. I knew exactly what was going to happen. That's exactly what happened. But it was wrong. And it's a visualization mistake combined with a bad skill of assessing the transpositions from minor piece to pawn end games. So, of course, after king e7, he plays e4. And there were two options here. I can take on e4 or I can play king to d6. I played king d6, but king d6 is a losing blunder, which is hard to believe in a simple position such as this one. <sighs> okay, if d4, knight e4, simply bishop to d6. And now if the pieces are not traded off, I'm going to play bishop b4, which means that his knight is restricted. And if it moves away, allowing uh, bishop to e1, then he's going to be tied down and my king will come to d5. And probably I can win that position. So he takes on d6. And again, this should be a draw. King c4. This I calculated correctly. This I calculated absolutely correctly. Like 10 moves deep that is going to be a draw. I understood the opposition. I saw all the pawn breaks and, and I knew everything. So this was my calculation. King c6, opposition. b4 takes, takes. f6. King c4, f5. King b4. I have to. I have no more moves to waste, but I can always keep the opposition. King c7, king b5, king b7, king c4, king c6. Very simple draw. Again, since I was trying to win this position, uh, I lost it. I played king d6. Ah, and here's the issue. He has the last pawn break, which I saw. I saw that he can play it. But I thought it was, a, it was close to a draw. But maybe I can win it more easily than if I take on e4. So again, ed, ed, knight b5. And he trades the pieces off, which I thought was okay. So king c6 takes, takes. And his last pawn break is f5. I should mention that if he doesn't play f5, then I play f5 and it's just all blocked. But after f5, instead of trying to win and probably drawing, I'm losing on the spot. There is, if, if it was a good player playing against him, he would have resigned here. I played on for a couple of more moves, even though as soon as he played f5, I realized my mistake and I knew that I was completely busted. But maybe he makes a mistake. So here is why king d6, king e3, king e7, king f4, king f6. I can never take, by the way, uh, if I take, then he just takes all of my pawns. So king d6, and once we get to this position, this is why he is winning, he plays g4, and that's it. I have to take it, uh, hg, king g, if I take on, on f5, then king h5. What do I do here? If I play king g7, he picks up the f5 pawn. If I play f4, he plays king g4. He has a passed pawn. He's going to win d5 and I can resign. So after king takes g4, I have to play king g7, which is also losing, but harder to win for white. King g5, f6 check. King g4, king h6. Fg takes h5, king h6, king f5, and I resigned. I really wish I didn't have to show you games like this. I mean, going through this again is really tough. Uh, I think I played well in the middle game. I played well for the majority of the end game as well. Uh, but yeah, it wasn't enough. I mean... These players don't miss opportunities and they punish every single mistake you make. And this is 
this was really hardcore training, both chess-wise chess -wise and psychologically. I think after this tournament, I became much stronger psychologically and in controlling my emotions. I had a couple of fairly big emotional breakdowns after these losses. I don't want to talk about this game anymore. Uh, I, but I have good news. There's a good game coming up really soon. <laughs> Okay, thank you for watching. Stay tuned for more chess. Bye-bye.